thank you so much for everybody joining me and waiting for me. I had a technical issue and these are really great slides. So I wanted to fix that before I started my live because it is a topic that you guys write in all about saying, Dr. Boz, Dr. Boz, is this ever going to go, go away? My lost hair must be due to my keto and I want to know why and how it happened. So uh, this took a little technical uh, teaching and I am happy to do that, the honors of teaching how to do this. I'm back in the saddle again today. We had our support group this morning at the at the bowling alley called the Pin Chasers here in Tampa. I was on the love boat, not really called the love boat, but the love boat <laughs> last week for the keto cruise. And boy, that was quite the success. We had um, last year somewhere around 170 folks on the on the keto cruise, and this year was over 350. Uh, I I kind of think talking about keto on a cruise is like like hosting an AA meeting at a whiskey ranch because <laughs> there's all kinds of problems with the temptations that go on inside a cruise, but it was great. It was really awesome. The The cruise is set up to do lectures on the days where, like a, it's like a floating conference, if you would. So lectures on the days where um, the boat is uh, sailing. And then when it's docked at the port, you uh, get um, to get off the boat and do whatever it is you want to do, if you're an excursion, and then the next day you come back and you do the next day of the conference. So it, it's a whole week of, of being with folks that are you know, trying to figure out their keto journey. And I get loud and clear several of the questions that I hear at the pin chasers as well, but it's almost like reassuring to say, yeah, the same questions I get at the pin chasers are the ones that everybody else is asking too. And this hair thing did come up a couple of times. I am showing my numbers and I was not perfect on the keto cruise, but, but I did uh, enjoy the time and I slept a lot and I used their steam sauna as many days as we could do it. So ketones 1.6, actually better than I thought they'd be. And my glucose of 87. Um, and I do want to say thank you to the folks that I, I never miss my Tuesday meetings. So I have these wonderful helpers that uh, really allow me to have a day uh, away from the from the uh, schedule and still support the people that are in my community. So I just want to say a special so shout out to their thank, their help. And uh, not going to lie, some of the questions that end up on this show are from those helpers saying, you really should answer this question because we get this a lot. So um, I, I do have a couple of really fun announcements before I hop over into that um, that um, um, that little education and here is the first one which is i don't know maybe it's common that other people get on the, the uh, this in this magazine but we are so excited about i want to show you this here go to um here this one here we go uh oh first of all hats off to my team that finally has our website uh, on a new platform handling this higher traffic at a much better pace um several of the um of the um, you know improvements that we've made were due to the volume that we've seen on the site. So take a check uh, of the of the new website and enjoy that speed. <laughs> we're fairly proud of it. Um, I do want to uh, point out the um, the Dr. Boz favorites is now on a drop down, and there's a few things we're going to talk about on that as we go forward. So be sure to be able to find the Dr. Oz favorites there. Again, those are the products that I use or that I endorse. And when you use the links that are on our site, we do get a little bit of uh, of in, of of commerce, of um, commission, and love it. So uh, thank you for all the hard work that's gone into that new website. But this is what I wanted to get to. Yes. I have a copy right here in my hand. So this is the this is the uh, Women's World magazine that I talked about last week, and I don't know if you can see on here up close and personal. This is Patty Bodner, who uh, is one of the many success stories that we have had, but it's just one of my favorites. It, it, she, you know that that. Um, tagline where people say, yes, you can reverse diabetes. And you've heard me say it several times. This is a choice. And oh my God, is that the best testimony where she was on insulin for 15 years 
and uh, or 10 to 15 years, took her A1C from double digits down to five. She no longer has diabetes. And her story is amazing. It is just so fun. She actually lives here in Florida and has traveled to our support group uh, several times. Really, I want to thank her for trusting us with her health and then just being brave enough to share her story. So I, I do have a way to that I, I would love to have you help us. Again, the, the date on this isn't till next Monday. So if you've been to the to the grocery store, like my husband went to the grocery store and said, we missed it, honey. It's not there anymore. And it was actually the opposite. It hadn't arrived yet. So it's d dated for, the, for next Monday, uh, June 19th. Uh, so show them, show the women's world that we are, we have lots more of your stories to tell. Uh, we think the best way to do that is to sell out the magazine. So buy all of them in the rack if you find it and hand it out to your neighbors because uh, it is a story worth reading. Uh, it is, if you're needing an, a little inspiration, man, that wins. It is a great, great story. So we're going to get into the slides right now because I am ready. Actually, I'm going to pour my drink before I do that. I am ready to uh, tackle this tough subject and, and really give you my, um, I, I've tried explaining this a couple times. My, my staff reminded me that I've never said it all out loud. <laughs> and that's a common mistake that I make. So I'm going to have some uh, pucker up. I'll, I'll tell you, this is what got me through my cruise. I took a whole box of this along. And then anytime I wanted to have a glass of wine, I would start with bubble water. Um, so whatever you call this, uh, soda water. And I'd put, I'd say, I want you to serve it to me in a pretty glass. <laughs> so usually a wine glass. And then I'd put bubble water with some pucker up in there. And well, I didn't, I didn't lose weight on the keto cruise, but um, I only gained a little. <laughs> so I think we can undo it. I think it also comes with, we did not buy the drink package that apparently is very easy to fall into the trap. And we did not buy the internet package, which was my saving grace. All right, let's get to this lesson because I, I hope you like it as much as I do. It's been on my mind to teach this for a while. All right, so there are four big hormones, and these are the motherships of how do you um, how do you uh, teach about um, hair loss? And this is a hormonal story if you've ever heard one. So let's begin on what what I like to start with on uh, hair loss. So this patient uh, is an example of what hair loss looks like when it's pathologic, when it's not normal. And this gal is, um, as you can see, you know, just looking at the crest of her hair, uh, you can see a lot of white, a lot of scalp. And this, this abnormal hair loss is related to hormones, is related to a problem that we see very commonly on the ketogenic diet. So uh, if you've seen this in you, or maybe not to this extreme, let me uh, back up and share uh, just a, a way that we score this or grade the scaling of hair loss. So if you look at these three different types, it is a rate at which you can lose hair. And I like to think of it as a rate at which the hormones have been depleted, have been not delivered to that, um, uh, that cell that needs them to survive. So you could call the top one uh, at the beginning a type one. And I would be considered a type one. I'm gonna give you an up close and personal. If I pull that hair part apart and say, can you see that um, line? When I was 15, you could see that that type one in the upper, upper left-hand corner there, uh, you could hardly see a scalp line. Now, as I pull that, that hair apart, you can see a scalp line. Uh, I'm 51, I'll be 52 in November. And the, by the time I'm 80, if my hair doesn't have any uh, strategic losses, even though I will go through menopause between now and 80, this is what my hairline should look like in a healthy aging process. When you move to type two or type three, there's a deficiency. This is not normal. So let's move on and um, just as you think of which of these patterns do you look at, uh, this is a woman's head that we're looking at, but men lose their hair too. And it is also a very hormonal problem. Um, 
So we're going to talk about hair and how it functions first. Excuse me for drinking one there. Uh, I'm actually, my fast, which I started when I got off the cruise, um, I did not, I did not want to. <laughs> so I've been, I've been a little crabby, but I, I'm, so I'm definitely thirsty and ready for food. Um, but I did make it, I think, uh, 48 plus, um, I think I'm at 52 hours, 54 hours, 54 hours. Okay, so this is a hair follicle. And I would love to draw on this, but my iPad could not handle these slides, so I'm doing this a different way. That was the delay and what got me to this moment here. So this hair follicle, you can see at the bottom there, there's a blood supply coming. And look at this as the cross section of a hair. That purple part would be the root of your hair. And then the brown is, it's a brown colored hair that's coming out of that hair follicle. Notice that yellowy white stuff is the, is the oil or the sebaceous um, secretions that keep your oil um, um, or keep your hair oiled um, and all that, that's what healthy looks like as we watch a hair in its life cycle there are three um, major stages to how hairs grow um, right now if you grabbed the hair on your head uh, these would be considered hairs in an antigen phase meaning I can't pull them out they're they're healthy they're not gonna <laughs> that look a little while there after I pull my hair um, the they, you can't pull them out they're healthy the the nourishment to that uh, follicle is intact and the length of the time the hair spends in the antigen phase is uh, from two to six years that uh, is not 52 years, meaning I have not had the hairs on my head for all 52 years. They're, the oldest hairs will be close to six years old, and the youngest ones are only two years old. When you look at a life cycle, um, it should constantly have a ratio of them turning over uh, from time to time. That turnover is stimulated by a stress, and the stress can be chronic built into uh, acute or it can be very dramatic it can be very uh, intense uh, like when the hair falls out from um, from a chemotherapy from radiation that's a very intense stress so the catagen phase which lasts one to two weeks is initiated when the hair has a stress after that initiation it takes about two weeks for it to enter into a telogen uh, phase. Once it's in that phase, it will take three months before it then can re-enter back into the antigen phase and then hopefully be there for two to six years. So uh, that's what hairs do in normal. So when folks come in and they are asking me, Doc, what is happening with my hair? Um, I'm going to do that little, uh, that little uh, rating scale on how much hair loss have they had. And in my mind, I'm going to be thinking about, let's do a history uh, to see where the stress came from because that's part of this. Uh, the other part of my, my equation is I'm going to be looking at the parts of the hair that are important for it to grow strong and healthy. And are those missing? So here we go, antigen phase, two to six years. Notice that hair is growing. Uh, the root stays strong, but that, um, that uh, uh, cartilage-like uh, structure, which is what a hair is made of, uh, is uh, keratin, excuse me, not cartilage. Keratin structure is uh, lengthening outside the root and that's how your hairs grow. The more uh, nourished and, and um, um, solid the production of those cells at the base of that hair follicle, the longer and stronger and thicker the hair follicle will be. There is a slight genetic component um, and that genetic component can be uh, the thickness of the hair and how long that tel this antigen phase lasts. How long do you get to grow hair before it will recycle into that stress point? So when people say yes, they're living in a very s in stressful environment. They're you know having no sleep or <laughs> some other s chronic stresses. Hair is one way to evaluate that. They will have less and less and less strong, thick hair follicles when you when you look closely at their scalp. All right, so here's our little hair follicle, and we just added some stress. And that stress will result in this happening at the root. So way deep into that hair follicle, at the base of it, the, the vasculature, which is what delivers the nourishment, pulls away from that root, 
And you can see that the hair follicle at the top has just turned gray. So think of it as it's dead, but it's still in your hair follicle. There's a little seed at the bottom of your hair follicle that um, will be the source of the new hair uh, if you're lucky enough to grow another one. So this uh, catagen phase uh, from the moment the stress happens to, the, to, the, to this ending, meaning they have separated the vasculature from the root and we have that hair follicle now kind of floating in the follicle but no longer attached uh, through the nourishment um, and the vasculature found in all of our hair roots. So now begins something called the telogen phase. This telogen phase is the reset. So in the reset, you can see that, that that little seed now has a blood supply back to it. And that blood supply will, um, will, will nourish the new replacement hair. But watch carefully what happens to the old hair. So the old hair has the, has the gray dead follicle at the bottom of it. And as that um, dead follicle um, uh, migrates out, there is a new base that is starting to rise. Now, you don't see the hair come out of the skin. Uh, and, I mean, you don't see the hair growing until it exits out of that top part of the skin. So it gets out of the, epi the dermis and into the uh, epidermis, out of the dermis and into the epidermis before it is something that you can touch on the outside of your skin or you can, you can feel or you can see it. Um, notice that blood supply there is in, in solid um, delivery, and now it gets these two to six years to grow again. All right, so let's go back to the scalp. The scalp, not normal. That is not normal. That is called male pattern baldness in a female. Uh, and it is directly correlated to some medical problems. The stress in here is related to this kind of patient. Um, that when I when people come in and say who is the most likely to benefit from a ketogenic diet, uh, the answer, in my mind, is the the mitochondria and the cells that are inflamed. Now that inflammation can look like a rash that's been on their back and tummy for years. That can look like arthritis inside their joints that just never gets better. Uh, that can be a foggy brain. That can be being overweight. But all of them conjure up this image in my mind of a cell that's inflamed. So as I look at hair, that, hair, that scalp, the first thing I think of is, oh, there are, there's so much cellular damage in all parts of her body that the outward manifestation of her hair is actually the least of her issues. I mean, it's very important to, to all of us, but um, it'll bring them in, but I do not focus on uh, that uh, that hair follicle, I focus on how do we nourish a hair follicle along with all these other cells. So we first start by looking at fat-built hormones. These fat-built hormones uh, include cortisol, uh, progesterone, aldosterone, vitamin D, uh, estrone, estradiol, testosterone. Uh, these are all hormones that are built out of a fat molecule called cholesterol. And that cholesterol uh, is, of course, what, um, what I've been talking about at this season of uh, speaking events is how do we measure whether this fat that we're eating, how does that turn into the fat in our, in our blood, and how does that cholesterol translate into a healthy, needed um, nourishment for every cell in our body? As and on the spectrum, what happens when there's an excessive amount of cholesterol that's not getting utilized or put in the right spots? So that cholesterol gets uh, transformed into these uh, these molecules of progesterone, aldosterone, estradiol, and testosterone. Um, but when I'm looking at somebody with a hair loss process, um, especially that woman's in the picture is chronic. That did not happen in a couple of weeks. That's been years in the making. And at the base of her cells, there's a hormone that's dictating this problem. Um, if you'll notice, I've, I've labeled three of these hormones in the in this diagram. The vitamin D, uh, I put uh, in, in yellow and it maybe because it comes from the sun, but it's also uh, that 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is a blood test that you can measure. Uh, there's testosterone and there is estrogen, both needed in 
both genders um, and those hormones do signaling for hair growth as well as cellular repair. But these fat-based chemicals are under the lock and dictation of insulin. This is the fourth hormone that really dictates how well can I help you fix that hair follicle. Uh, that it is not uncommon for people to say, yeah, yeah, doc, I know I'm gaining weight. I've had this weight on for years. Now my hair is falling out. And it is this constant attrition of the circulation of these fat molecules, these fat-based hormones, uh, they're not in the circulation. Insulin is pushing them into the fat cells and it locks them in there. So if you'll notice in this picture, I've got those little, um, those circles of vitamin D, testosterone, and estrogen stuck in his fat. And they're going to stay there. And anytime you swallow vitamin D or your body produces testosterone or estrogen, it is going to be stored in your fat cells immediately. Uh, there's a, you know, a classic mistake that happens in my clinic where patients come in and say, Doc, I want to get on testosterone replacement. And I have a friend and he took it and his hair started growing again and he looks great. Um, and I said, well, the, that's a great idea that we, we could definitely do that. Uh, know that if I start replacing your testosterone, that your system will stop doing it. Uh, and if your body really doesn't make it anymore, that's a great thing. I'd be happy to help you. But if the problem is that the testosterone your body's making, you have so much insulin that you've been slowly raising the amounts of insulin over the years that whatever insulin your body, whatever testosterone your body produces, there is a tsunami of a very authoritative insulin that says, put that in the fat cells. So no matter how much I inject in you, it will still have that same consequence. It will still end up in your fat cells. Um, all right, so let's go back and watch what happens. If we take this insulin and we, um, oopsie, wrong button. If we take this insulin and, and we correct it, now that is a mouthful. <laughs> we know that when you first get onto the ketogenic diet, you do lower insulin and that sense of lowered insulin opens up these fat cells. One of the ways that we can measure the movement of, uh, uh, of or the stability of your insulin that, that it's gone from a certain level and it's now lower. It may still be overall high, but it's relatively lower, is if we constantly measured your vitamin D that's in circulation. Because what happens next is that as the insulin lowers, those fat cells now can release, they are unlocked. And they release not only their nourishment, they release their vitamins that are stored inside their, their um, uh, fat cells. So when I am talking to these men and say, yes, I know you don't want to have the problems that come along with being overweight. Uh, I know that many of them are very demasculinating. They've got, you know, man boobs and they've got, um, you know, testes that are not um, healthy. They don't have uh, a sex drive like they've had in the past. Um, and I said, the fastest way for you to get the use out of testosterone is to open up your fat cells. And that is to put your body in a state of ketosis and keep it there. Um, as you look at um, the same process in a hair follicle. A hair follicle has, um, has the, same, um, the same things that happen. Let me just back up one second here. Uh, so when you're looking at a, a cell, and we use these, this word hormone, uh, it gets that term because this molecule will go to a cell. The cell will bring it into its cytoplasm. And once it's inside the cytoplasm, it will alter it, usually in the area of the mitochondria. And then it allows that molecule to go into the nucleus, which now causes it to transcribe different proteins. So when, when you're deprived of testosterone and we replace testosterone in, in a man or a, or a woman, uh, adding that hormone back will do different things to their, their brain cells uh, than it will to their, their sex organs. It will do different things to their skin than it will to their heart. 
And those different things are dictated by what proteins are made when that hormone is influencing um, the mechanisms inside your nucleus. I know that's really sciencey, but people say the word hormone and they think, well, what does that matter? What does that matter? Uh, so I show you this picture of this obese man and we unlock those fat cells and now this testosterone and estrogen and vitamin D are in circulation. They can be used by these cells. So let's go back and I'll show you what happens next. So here's this hair follicle and it's got uh, um, blood supply going to and from that the, the core, the root. Um, but in this case, uh, we have high insulin. So the insulin causes that any, any of these hormones that are coming into circulation, instead of getting into the intended cell, they are being stored in these fat cells. And they will stay there until the dictator quiets down. And that dictator is insulin. So if we take insulin and we uh, lower the insulin, the first thing that I wanna point out is that is stressful. So did you notice that our hair follicle went from a normal hair color and now the, the vasculature has has pulled away from the root. Uh, our little seed is in there, but our, our hair follicle has turned gray. That's stressful. That, that switch from having your body have a high insulin state, and now we put you in a ketogenic state, we just caused a very dynamic stress inside your system. Now, the stress is worth it. Uh, as you watch, we've unlocked that, that, um, that um, insulin dictated problem. And here come these hormones that have been in storage in those fat cells. And now it is at the root of this hair follicle. And at the root of that hair follicle, you will remember that um, we had the antigen phase, which is where your body was hanging out when it was in that, you know, pre ketogenic phase. Uh, we added ketosis. And during that two weeks where you keto adapt, where you push your body into a state of ketosis, even if you fall off the wagon in three weeks, if you push yourself into a hearty ketosis and your hair follicles have been deprived of these, um, these hormones for a long period of time, which is a really common problem uh, as people age. They don't realize how fragile these hair follicles are because they're starving for these hormones. Uh, so that two weeks of stress happens but your hair looks the same. They're like, doc, I feel great. My brain is doing better. I'm sleeping better. They don't have hair anywhere on their radar. They are not thinking about this at all. But what's happening deep inside their body is that hair follicle is, well, it's resetting. And it's going to take about three months before that hair follicle now pushes it out of uh, that, uh, that, that chamber. And here's how this story usually goes. They're struggling, uh, or I mean, they're doing, they're struggling, they go on a ketogenic diet, they put their body through that stress, nothing's noticeable with their hair, they're doing pretty well. Maybe they've fallen off the wagon a little bit, but they got back on, they're going to their support group, <laughs> and they are doing great until one day there's just, there's hair in the, on the floor of the shower. Uh, I think I might, might be dying, all this hair is falling out, I feel so good, but, Something's wrong, doc. I looked on the internet and it says the ketogenic diet can do this. They're not lying. That is true. Uh, but it is a means to an end. That, that that hair follicle had been deprived of the hormones that you really needed to give it for the last 20 years. And as we say, okay, let's switch over to a different uh, uh, fuel. That's a stress on the body. And that hair follicle will shut down. And now as you are unlocking those hair follicles or unlocking those hormones, it is getting delivered to the hair follicle, at which point it's going to begin to grow. But that's about the time they show up in my clinic and say, what is the matter? And I'm like, hold the course, stay in ketosis, do not fall off the wagon, stay the course. And many times they don't listen to me. They'll go to, they'll go to Amazon and they'll say, oh, there's this magical shampoo that I'm going to put on my hair and it's going to start growing hair again. And they spend the $50 or whatever the expensive shampoo is. They rub it in their hair. And lo and behold, two weeks later, there's hair. And I'm like, yeah, that's not how this works. <laughs> 
that is not how this works. It takes far longer than that for the hair to begin to grow after it's been damaged. It's a three month process to get it from the bottom of the shutdown phase to be peeking out the edges of their hair follicle. So it is not the consequence of that shampoo. It is uh, very important that they stay consistently keto if they want hair to be in restoration. If they want to take that wide, let's go back to our slide deck here. If they want, if they take that wide um, uh, hairline uh, and they say, I don't want to have that. Uh, so I bring this up, uh, this vitamin D test, because it is the one thing where when people say, well, how do I know? How do I know if I'm doing a good job of uh, of allowing my uh, my fat to unlock these hormones and put it back in circulation. I'm like, measure it. <laughs> measure it, yes. So I, I brought this, uh, my, my, my show and tell. Uh, th this kit is uh, one of the ones that I sell. I, I actually um, sell a two-pack where you can have your vitamin D checked. And then if it is not normal, start taking vitamin D and then check it again. And if you're taking a bunch of vitamin D and you're like, doc, I cannot seem to get my vitamin D higher, then one thing that is connected to this is you can't, um, you can't keep that vitamin D in circulation if your insulin is really high. And that's where teaching this ketogenic process, teaching about that Dr. Boz ratio, that lowering the blood sugar, raising your ketones. Again, I don't prick my finger every time I get on this live show because I think it's fun. I don't fast because I think this is a lovely thing. It is a part of my example to you, but also I, I don't want to have hair, my hair falling out. I like my hair, uh, but I also really like my brain and I like my heart <laughs> and I like my bones. And when you look at how much that fat-based molecule does inside those cells, uh, well, it has to be able to get to the cells to do that. So you can go to my Dr. Boss favorites and click on Omega Quant, uh, and you can buy one test for half the price. Or you can buy a two-pack, and that does support my business. Thank you very much. But here's why. Um, if it's not normal, then do something about it and check it again. This is one of those tests where you prick your finger, you let you drip the blood off of your finger onto a sponge, and you send that into the lab to get your, your vitamin D tested. As many of you know that have watched the show for a while, this is, happens at my house before school starts every year. We check it again at Christmas. Uh, we have contests, which I have been uh, losing in recent years <laughs> to see whose vitamin D is uh, the best. And my kids... Youth is amazing. <laughs> I think that's my last slide, but I just want to make sure I didn't uh, leave one on the table for you. Yeah, that's the last slide. So I, I am going to get over to your questions, lickety split here, because that is, this is the one place where I try to make sure to answer your questions. We have about 20 minutes to get through those questions. And I, I want to say a few moments of thank you for those people who did come up to me at the keto uh, cruise. Again, I hung out with them for a week. I tried to go to as many of the lectures as I could uh, I could talk my husband into letting me go to. It, again, was our vacation as well. And um, for those people that know me well, you know that I don't vacation very well. I, I tend to be a little too intense. So shutting down was a good thing for me. I do want to give a couple of shout outs for the upcoming places that I will be soon. One of them is um, the Keto uh, Orlando Summit. I will not be speaking, and it's because I have kids' schedules that I wasn't sure of and I couldn't commit uh, to that, but it is just a hop, skip, and a drive from where we live, and so I, I love the organization that puts it on. That is um, August 3rd through the 6th. It's in Orlando. If you're going to be there, we'll be there with a booth, and we're trying to come up with a couple things that we're going to do, so hang in there. We'll figure that out. Um, but we will be supporting that organization and the interns that are working for me for the summer. We're hoping to get them to come and help me run the booth as well. Uh, and then October 6th through the 8th, I will be visiting Louisville for the first time in my life. I've never been there. Uh, and I get to help Autumn uh, Winters, who was also on the keto cruise, her and her husband, Richard, uh, great couple, really excited about the work they're doing, the community they're creating. And um, I'll be speaking there. Um, again, that's October 6th through the 8th. So, all right, let's get over to your questions. This is my favorite part. Um, and boy, you've got a, a bunch of them started. So this is, this is great. 
All right, so let's start with uh, Debbie, who says, been doing keto um, since your 21-day um, metabolic reboot. Uh, noticing lots of hair loss in the last few weeks. Will collagen and biotin help? All right, first of all, that's a great question. Um, I get this one a lot. Um, I am not... Um, uh, I am not too proud to say that I've had a couple of answers for this over the years, and I'll tell you where that data comes from. Um, when when people are trying to stimulate um, hair growth, uh, the first thing that hap- has to happen is that slide deck I just went through. They have to decrease their insulin. The delivery of vitamin D to the hair follicle needs to be present that uh, the testosterone and estrogen have to get to that little root in order for these right things to happen. So that's step one and is the most easy to impact. Uh, It's the most reversible. The other part of the equation is um, fibroblasts are the cells that, that help make that little nugget at the bottom of your hair follicle. And when that has regressed or it's very dormant, getting that to wake up uh, can be stimulated by um, the particles uh, of um, collagen and um, biotin to a lesser extent, but collagen for sure. They're called collagen snippets. And there's a there was a time where I, I thought I would make a product with that. And so I got, you know, I put all the money and energy into it. And then I got to doing some more research and I just couldn't put my name behind it because it's a bit of false advertising. Uh, It's not that it doesn't stimulate the fibroblast to awaken. But if you look at the majority of people that are struggling with hair loss and with the reversal or the, you know, the aging process, but then they're too young to have that aging process, um, the most common problem is these four hormones, the estrogen or the, t- the insulin, the estrogen, testosterone, and vitamin D. Uh, so to, to give people that, um, that collagen snippet with the assumption that it was going to help their hair grow, it is such a minor component to what that hormone reset is that I, I pulled back and I just said, keep your money. I'm, I'm not going to do it which is, was hard for me to do, but it's, that was the truth. That was the right thing to do for, in my case. Uh, all right, so good question, Debbie. I hope that answers your question. Focus on the insulin. Get those Dr. Boss ratios low in the morning. You know, there's nothing like, um, I mean, I'm counting down to the 21 days because our whole team does this. They're all involved. It's a very intense part of our, uh, our, um, our yearly cycle here at the Dr. Boss brand. And I'll tell you, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait because any habit that slips back, and each time I've done it, each time I've led a support group where we've done, or I've been on the journey with a patient, whether it's my mom or somebody that I've said, okay, I will do this with you. You know, watching that that habit stacking of being a little better than I was at last season. Yeah, I'm excited for September <laughs> to work on some of the habits that I need to work on. So um, don't feel like one uh, one trip through the through the workbook is gonna be always all you need. Maybe maybe you need a friend to go through it with you. All right, let's go to the next question. All right, we have Nancy who says, hi everyone and hello, Dr. Boz. I've been losing hair for about a year and nothing has helped. Thank God I had a lot to start with. Supplements haven't helped. And that's a very common story. And, and it's why I pulled back from the ones that do have the, the collagen in them. If you're healthy, if you have no insulin problems, if you're trying to prevent the loss of hair, then collagen has really good data. I always love how supplement companies, when they do the some of the trials, oh, I'm sore, uh, they, they do the trials on healthy people who have normal insulin. I'm like, that is so not fair. <laughs> That's not the people that come and knocking on the door saying, can you fix this doc? So um, Nancy, I would say what I probably said to Debbie, which is, the hormones have everything to do with it. If you want to know if your insulin's lower, getting an insulin test isn't the way to do it. Uh, yes, it will give you an answer for that one day, but that's not how insulin works. Insulin is very volatile. So checking a Dr. Boz ratio, which means insulin is going to influence two molecules in your body very intensely and constantly. One of those is glucose. One of those is ketones. When you measure them together and you put them in a ratio, we are now predicting 
with pretty good accuracy what your insulin is doing. And when people level out and say, Doc, I used to make great teaching, I used to have a good Dr. Boz ratio, but I don't anymore, uh, we say, well, welcome to your new normal. Welcome to your body adapting to your new way of living. Now it needs a stress. And you'll see that stress when your glucose goes down and your ketones go up. That's how you lower a Dr. Boz ratio. The lower the Dr. Boz ratio, the lower the insulin resistance. Uh, so I would focus on those Dr. Boz ratios. If you don't have the workbook, it's a great way to map out. If you want to do the electronic version of that, there's a free uh, guide on my website that um, has, let's see if I can quickly do that for you here. Um, on our website, oh, right here, uh, not fat, the, there's a fat can save your life. Oh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. Uh, and then there's a, oh yeah, hey, I can. So this is the free download. It's a spreadsheet where it keeps track of your Dr. Boz ratios. Uh, I'll tell you that one of my favorite people, uh, Patrick V, uh, is the one who, who put this together and he has a ton of resources on the other tabs of that spreadsheet. So it's a great free resource um, and that's a wonderful way for you to track your um, ketones. If you were in the 21 day course and you have uh, your support group, you can share your dashboard and look at everybody else's glucose and insulin that's in your support group. That's a big, big deal. And I think is one of the easiest ways to, to really keep people on, on track for their, um, for their um, continued health journey. Paula writes in and says, I have been having excessive hair loss since January and been taking minerals, but can't seem to get enough. How do we know if we have a balanced minerals, what will help uh, absorb them and what's too much? So when it comes to the, the minerals that are part of a hair follicle, again, it's a minor part of it. I mean, it's, it's a critical part of it. Um, you know, I have found that when uh, people focus on the consumption of minerals, it's not nearly as uh, important as what is, I, I don't like this word, what is leaking out your gut. Uh, when you look at the permeability uh, or the, the nice seal that your gut is supposed to do, the minerals that you do take in should stay in. But when they don't stay in, uh, uh, it's that, that those cells don't fit together tightly. They don't have a good slime layer in place. And that, um, that's a reflection of chronic inflammatory states that if, uh, if somebody comes in to my uh, environment and they've got one of the worst problems for gut permeability, which would be Crohn's disease. They have big ulcers uh, bleeding out. So there's not just like micronutrients leaking out. They've got, I mean, they've got stool going into their body and they've got um, blood leaking out. I mean, it's, it's awful. Uh, and that uh, journey is, um, I mean, their minerals are terrible. So what do we do? We do not focus on get the minerals. You're going to pour them in and they're going to leak right back out. We focus on sealing up their gut, about improving their metabolic health, about decreasing their inflammation. And we do, I mean, they do the 21 day and they're, at, I mean, they do, that's an intense course, okay? Uh, it is very much uh, uh, high accountability and but it is the kind of reset in a chemical level at a cellular chemistry level that will allow a gut to heal. And, you know, Crohn's is an awful disease. Um, watching it heal uh, when they're in crisis is, I mean, it's, it's miraculous to watch that. Um, and in my first part of my career, I didn't think that was possible. I didn't know it was possible. Uh, it is one of the reasons I continue to, to say, put this stuff out there for free, give these, the information to the patients that I would be giving them behind an exam room door because nobody should be suffering from a chronic inflammatory disease in 2023. This is reversible. It's intense to get your game back on. But when people say, I've been taking the supplements, I, I just can't seem to get it to work. Quit focusing on the supplements. Focus on the cellular health. And when that health is optimal, it seals, and the minerals you pull in will reset. You have a kidney that's a hundred times smarter than the nephrologist that would try to balance those minerals inside you. Uh, great question though, and I get that one a lot. Oops, wrong one. Let me try that one. Okay, so let's go to, <laughs> does HRT, hormone replacement therapy, help hair loss? Well, uh, Dro Love, uh, I hope that I answered that while we were talking, that 
sure, testosterone will make hair grow, especially in men and in women. Uh, but you don't get to get the testosterone to that hair follicle if your insulin is out of control. You're wasting the money on the injections. You might as well inject it into the toilet. Uh, when you look at uh, the danger of chronically injecting that hormone is within three years. That testy, uh, uh, can no, that, that endocrine uh, uh, adrenal gland can no longer make the hormones that, require, that are required to get testosterone and estrogen in, uh, specifically testosterone though. It's a three-year process where you can hardly see them ever come back from the edge of injecting when that testosterone's been over secreted into their body and it's not in that pulsatile way that their endocrine that their adrenal glands and their testes um, convert that hormone into active testosterone it's in a burst i give it a shot <laughs> once a week once every other week once a month it's in a patch it's in a stable level that's not how the hormone was meant to be and when you do that to men um, it stops the stimulus for them to make it so anyway uh, so it does help hair loss, but it, there's a there's a ba there's a package there, <laughs> a smaller package actually. Uh, okay, so um, let's go back to the questions here. So think for yourself. Writes in and says, I thought we shouldn't be worried about too much protein and gluconeogenesis. I ask about why my sugar went up the next day after eating double quarter pounders and was told too much protein. Okay, I just put out a video on this. I think it was Sunday, it was a short, so less than 30 seconds to focus on the answer for this. But the answer is, uh, I wouldn't be looking at how much protein you had. I would be looking at what time of day you ate that protein. I would be looking at the number of hours that you went without food and you stop the timer at sunrise. At sunrise, my insulin resistant patients, again, these are not my healthy patients, these are my insulin resistant patients, the people who've been overweight for 10, 20 years. Their sugars rise in the morning at such a level that you should count it as a meal, even though you don't eat. There's so much sugar coming out of your liver from the stimulus that your brain says, hey, it's time to wake up. That cortisol surge should be 10, 15 points maybe. But in insulin resistant patients, it shoots up 20 points and it doesn't go back down because there is a tsunami of glucose coming out of their, their, their liver. That happens every morning, for sure. So if that happens at 5.30 in the morning, I wanna know from 5.30, you know, minus back to midnight, so that's five and a half hours. And then if you last ate at nine o'clock, that's you know four more hours, that's um, only been nine hours since you've eaten. Like, oh, isn't that enough? I'm like, not if you're insulin resistant. Mm -mm. You, need a, you need an absence of calories for somewhere close to 12 hours, 16 hours. So their last, I would, I would ask, think for yourself, I would say, well, what hour did you eat those um, double quarter pounders without the bun or whatever? And you say, well, and did you, is the, was the right thing to have that much volume of food in the afternoon? Now, for you newbies out there, this is not how you begin a ketogenic diet. Uh, this is the answer to someone who's been doing keto for a while and gets to a plateau and says, well, wait a minute, why, why am I not progressing? Why am I not getting better? And the answer has a whole bunch to do with, oh, you have a chemistry set in there and you, you need to be looking at that chemistry set in order to find your answers. The way you do that is you do what I'm doing. You check your morning numbers, glucose, ketones in the morning. What is your Dr. Boz? Ooh. Dr. Bob's ratio in the morning. <laughs> All right. Oh, one of my favorite people is next. Sue Monroe writes in and says, uh, question for Dr. Boz. Uh, I, I got the LP little A test you recommended as well as the ApoB and the NMR. The LPA was 80, LPA was 83.7. ApoB was 86 and LPIR was 25. Triglycerides less than 35, HDLC was 80. Cardiologist said I need to take a statin due to the ascending aorta dilated. Oh yeah, okay, so LPA at 83.7. I'm pretty sure that's abnormal. I, I, I don't wanna um, risk your life on it though, so let me, um, let me Google it here. <laughs> Just the, the normal, normal level for LP little a. Normal level for LP little a. 
Yeah, it should be less than 14. That's what I thought. I'm like, it's like in the teens, right? So an LP little a, unless that's a typo, that's very high. So that means your LP little a has always been high, Suman Ro. That is a genetic risk factor. Uh, your ApoB of 86 is wonderful. That means with your genetics, you're doing great. But the problem with people who have LP little a is they also um, have a very high predisposition for pathology in their aorta, in their aortic valve. Um, so that ascending a, uh, aortic dilation, um, well, that's curious, and that's never something you want to read about. Uh, but you definitely want to know, is there any stenosis or any stiffening to that aortic valve? Because APO, L, LP little a, it is a genetic thing. You've had it your whole life. Uh, there is uh, an antidote to lowering it. That's a different, statins are part of that. And I'm not saying that that's the right answer in your case because you had this forever and the statins are really going to lower the, the LDL load. When it comes to LP little a, I'd want to see your NMR. <laughs> so I, I love Sumin Ro. So we should use you as a case study. <laughs> Um, the punchline is your doctor is probably not wrong as far as the risk that is associated with that high of an LP little a. Uh, this is not medical advice, but um, if that was my patient, I would be saying we need a cardiologist. We need to measure the stiffness of that aortic valve. But I would be praising the uh, daylights out of you for having an APOB B that is so low with that genetic risk and having your triglycerides so low. Um, and having a coronary artery calcium score that's so low. So again, lots of praise in there, but there's a genetic risk factor that no matter how much you fast or go to the sauna, you can't change that genetic. So good question, Sue. Uh, Ranger 231, Dr. Boz, what do you think of cool sculpting for fat loss? <laughs> I see there are clinics all over Pinellas County. Well, <laughs> That is a great question. Cool sculpting is a manipulation of your fat mass. And although it can make you look better on the outside and there is some fat reduction, it does not turn over your mitochondria. And that would, isn't that the point? Isn't the point of, um, you know, making your system um, do, uh, you know, paying a lot of money, first of all, and then having the outside of your body look smoother with less fat uh, the cool sculpting is not going to give you the health benefits that you need because it does not turn over mitochondria it does not cause mitophagy which is autophagy of the mitochondria uh, all right i'm checking my numbers here i don't know what they're going to be but uh, let's go on to the next question and then i'll show you my answers here question okay amy k says dr boz from roanke virginia never been there I'd like to go. Oh, ketones are up to 2.6, but what's my glucose? Hold on here. Um, okay, uh, what are your thoughts on eating one meal every other day? So I'll just show you my numbers here. Oh, glucose of 68, ketones of 2.6. If somebody can do the math for me on that. Um, I have tried doing that for about two weeks now. Okay, I, I write about this in my book, uh, in the Keto Continuum, and I talk about it in the workbook, that uh, eating a meal every other day, I have had patients do this for the, a two-month process. It's difficult, uh, and but it's better than a, <laughs> uh, it's better than a 36-hour fast, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, the longer fast of getting to a uh, 48-hour fast, so it's 48-hour fast every other day is essentially what they're doing. I, I really have them map out their social life before we start. The biggest sabotage that I see for that eating a meal every other day is usually we're trying to reach a goal. We are trying to you know, get over a chemotherapy. We're trying to seal that leaky gut. We're trying to really deal with some residual seizures. So I'm trying to push their metabolism higher. Um, I'll also be pushing their mitochondria in different ways, like a sauna schedule or uh, a resistant training schedule that gets their heart rate up, at least into zone two. Um, even, a, even a cardio workout. I really like their cardio workout to come from the sauna. It just has such better data. And usually my folks are, they have, they've got ailments that keep them out of the, um, and some of them can do it, but 
I, I, the, the sauna turns out to be one of the places I think are pretty darn great. So I would be looking at what's your goal? Why are you doing this? And I would guess there's a good reason behind why you're doing it, that you're trying to either improve a metabolism, get over a cardiac issue, you know, re, re, autophagy for brain health or something. Uh, so have a set goal. I tell them, okay, so that means you're going to eat on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or sometimes that's not the, they like to eat on Friday and Saturday, and then they fast Sunday, they eat on Monday, they fast on Tuesday, and they eat on Wednesday, they fast on Thursday, and they eat on Friday and, and Saturday. And it's because there's such overlap with those social events on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, that's, the, that's the way I've seen it sustained, and they really have to show me that they're getting that social interaction with that food. The reason why is that the, the biggest sabotage for people doing a meal every other day was they got isolated. And especially after COVID, people didn't need any help with that. Um, all right, so we've got um, three more questions. And because I started late, I will finish these. So hang in there. Thanks for sticking with me. And I'm sorry I got started late. Hi, Dr. Boz from Texas. Can you address what is going on with your when your blood pressure goes up when starting this uh, way of eating, what is the best way to get it to lower? Okay, so when a, when they're in a ketogenic, when they're entering a ketogenic state, the flux of what happens and then it lower and it can rise, it shouldn't be rising at a steady level. In fact, when they're pushing into a state of ketosis, it is quite the diuretic. It is it will wring out quite the excess inflammation, which usually lowers their blood pressure. I have people in that workbook, you'll see me say, if you're on day three, you've got to be checking your blood pressure. If you're on day four, you've got to be checking your blood pressure. If you're on day five, you got to be checking your blood pressure. And it's because when it hits their uh, system, they have to be in communication with their doctor, especially if they're taking blood pressure medicines. So when people have, um, I, I want to make sure it's not a typo, that your blood pressure is going up. Um, first of all, I need you to work with a doctor on that for sure. Uh, the blood pressure is... I mean, there's a stress component to that, but that usually is not a continuous process for um, causing high blood pressure. That will be high and then low. So here's some rules. When it comes to blood pressure, you never judge on one number. People don't die of high blood pressure for a day. They die with high blood pressure for months. So it's that accumulation of constant high blood pressure. In transition, things are going to go high and then they're going to come back down. You do not make decisions on blood pressure from one day's worth of data. You need time. So help your doctor. Write it down. Don't write it down when you're standing up giving a live YouTube show. <laughs> That's not normal. Uh, and at the same respects, don't, you know, do a Zen moment and, you know, feel, you know, lovely because that's not your life either. Do your life. Sit down. Sit there for two minutes. Check it on a, an arm that uh, is at the level of your heart. But you should not be contracting the muscle. Your arm should be resting. If you want to see, if you want to do an experiment, you put the blood pressure cuff on and then tense up your uh, your muscle and then push go and watch how high the pressure is when the muscle is tensed. You need to relax the muscle in order to get accurate blood pressures at home. The blood pressure cuffs at home are pretty darn good. They, their technology went through a major learning curve about 15 years ago and now you can hardly find them without using the technology that gets everybody the accurate numbers. So um, the other part that I've seen go wrong is people... You should be adding salt, but some people really overdo it, <laughs> uh, and that can be reflected in a blood pressure. The salt is a minor transition, though, so it doesn't usually play out for days on end. All right, two questions left, uh, and it looks like there's a good one. So Wendy writes in and says, "My aunt was just recently diagnosed with cancer. She is about, she is only about 90 pounds. How do you explain keto?" Okay, so again, how old is this person? What kind of cancers do they have? Um, you know, one of the keys that I talk about when it comes to patients who write in about cancer is um, it's a problem, you know, it's a problem and it's a journey that's very near and dear to my heart that, you know, this, this is how I got into keto is my mom got cancer. I'm a brain freak. I was, you know, looking into the ketogenic diet because of what it does to their brains. But I dove in head, you know, line and sinker when it was my mom's life who had cancer. So when people who write in and say, my friend has cancer, um, I, I like to refer to, let's see if I have that book here. Uh, 
It's usually right behind me. It's called failure. It's called failure of nerve, and it's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I'll try to have it out for next week. Um, and it's by Friedman. Um, is his last name, and he's a Jewish rabbi. He's been studying families and the patterns of their behavior and how that's passed on to generations. Has a great book of fables that is very fun to teach from. But in Failure of Nerve, he talks about there are two things that you can do to change someone else's behavior. And that is work on you and stay connected to them. Uh, You can't disown them and expect them to be influenced by you. And you can't um, tell them to do one thing and not do it yourself, which is why I stepped into that ketogenic diet to walk with my mom. If my mom was 90 pounds, I would have still done the ketogenic diet. Again, the, the best metric to measure someone's health and their robust energy to fight off what they're going to need to do in a, in a state of cancer is not the scale. And if she's at 90 pounds, there's probably more problems than, um, than just a metabolic history. Uh, but if it was my mom, I would have walked with her to say, no, we need your metabolism to be as strong as possible to fight off infection, to seal out the bad things to heal from the chemotherapy and to keep your mind from fading last question from darlene writes in and says i lost 30 130 pounds following the keto keto continuum recently i gained back 12 i've been doing keto continuum number five with a weekly 36 hour fast for six weeks was magic before but weight is not budging suggestions oh such a good question thanks for giving me that one guys uh, you know that is a classic place of saying all right you have uh the last time you stressed your system that 36 hours was enough to cause a stress in your metabolism that resulted in weight gain and congratulations on the 130 pounds um, but you're at a new normal and that new normal now requires a different level of stress so I'll take for example, I moved from South Dakota to Florida and we <laughs> picked a place to live that signed us up for an hour commute to and from school and work for my son and I. That did not leave time for me to have a workout. And there were too many other crazy things going on in life too that I just was like, my goal was one time a week. That stress of pushing my body with a workout two to three times a week was my previous goal. Uh, I couldn't do it. I, there was not enough time. I, I, I couldn't do it. Um, so I added fasting uh, a longer into that, you know, 50 hours, 60 hours, 72 hours um, to keep the stress once a week uh, to counteract that I couldn't do those workouts. Now we've actually moved and we have a house full of boxes uh, and the commute is not long. Uh, so I have... I have returned time in my life. And so what am I going to add back into my life? Because if I do everything just the same, um, or if I go back to a lesser stress of 36 hours, well, then I need to be pushing my mitochondria in other areas. So either I need to be getting into the sauna more frequently, or I'll need to make sure I get to the workout that three times a week, uh, two to three times a week, hopefully three times a week. (laughs) I'm working on that. but it's the same thing, Darlene, where you pushed your body and you gave it a stress. And that metabolic stress did take fuel out of storage and used it. And you have the right chemistry set to do that again, but the level of stress needed to reverse uh, stored energy and not add to stored energy uh, is not what you did before. So that 36-hour fast either needs to turn into uh, 48. So I would get uh, two nights of, um, of not eating. Um, you know that in my in the book, I encourage people to do eight weeks of a 72-hour fast. I would highly recommend you do it with a partner. Uh, it's amazing what happens when you're sharing data. So use the Keto Mojo dashboard data sharing so that you have a partner that can see your numbers. It changes everything about your commitment. And then don't give up until you get eight consecutive ones in a row. And it's magic. It's absolutely a new toolbox in your... Um, in your uh, list of uh, options. Um, So there's one thing I want to do before I sign off, and that was somebody wrote in uh, a week ago, and I thought I answered them, but I didn't. Let's 
let's see if I can go to um, Don't run away. Uh, here we go. Okay, so I told them, they said, I want to know what it is that you break your fast with. So I <laughs> I thought I had an example of this here today uh, with me, but I don't. So I'm going to put this in the comment section, and then I'm going to pin it. And I think it stays pinned. I hope it stays pinned in when I'm off the live because I want to show you that when I get done with my fast, if I do not want to eat when I get home, usually I have the crumbs and they are this little bitty bag that is uh, 1.4 ounces and it's carnivore crisps, but it's the brisket. And I put the link in the show notes so that you can say, that's what I do. I have these little bags of 1.4 ounces so I do not overeat when I get home. I use that as my meal because <laughs> it's late. I shouldn't be eating at this hour. Um, and that that consumption of uh, of crumbs is I, I add a little extra salt, but it really is a great little trick to say at the end of my fast. In a perfect world, I wouldn't eat till tomorrow morning, but I'm not perfect, people. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next week. And again, thank you for the forgiveness.